Nicole, how you doing? Happy Friday. Hi, Adam. Happy Friday to you. Uh, to everybody listening, I first had the pleasure of meeting Nicole in uh, late 2018 when I first became director of education for LLN and for Sean. And I observed her teach at, uh, in, was it Embankment Charter in Jersey City? Was that the correct name of the school? Yes, it was the Embankment School. Yes. Oh, not Embankment Charters, the Embankment School. Yes. And then Nicole subsequently observed me at Hoboken Charter. Definitely Charter in my school's name. <laughs> and uh, we had the opportunity to work together on a lot of social and emotional learning projects during the pandemic, uh, remotely, of course. Uh, but uh, Nicole gets to be uh, interview series number four here for the LLN newsletter. And uh, I'm nice. super honored to, uh, to have you here, Nicole. The honor is mine. The yeah. honor and the pleasure is mine. So, uh, Nicole, to everybody at LLN listening and even anybody outside of LLN, uh, do you remember uh, why exactly you decided to become a teacher? I decided to become a teacher because I, I wanted to be helpful to children. Uh, my mother was a teacher's aide in um, United Cerebral Palsy when I was a young, young child. And on the few occasions when I was off from school and she was working, I would go to school with my mom and I would sit with the children and, you know, maybe read them stories and interact with them. And at that point, it, it planted a seed in me. It, I loved the way it felt to be helpful to the children. Yeah. Nicole, were you older than the students that you were reading to? I was same approximately age? the same age because, um, because the children had disabilities, some of them, you know, oh, cognitive okay. as well as physical. Um, I was able to be, I was able to be a few steps ahead of some of the children. And I also, I was also one of those kids who taught myself how to read when I was about three. Uh, it's super impressive. Everybody's good at something. Of course. <laughs> um, so Nicole, uh, do you speak any other languages besides Spanish? Your English isn't bad, obviously. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, just English and Spanish. I'd no, love to learn another one um, in the future, but for now, English and Spanish. No, no, uh, no Portuguese since it's so close. They didn't make you uh, and all the Portuguese and uh, Brazilians living in West Orange. It's interesting. Um, I can I can read and understand um, some a bit of the Romance languages, a bit of Portuguese, a bit of um, a bit of French, a bit of Italian. But the pronunciation and the vocabulary, those both, um, you know, those both are a bit limiting for me. Outstanding. How, how did you learn your Spanish? My father began teaching me when, I, again, when I was a very small child, um, my dad, my dad worked in downtown Newark for many, many years, and he would learn kind of um, just conversational Spanish from just being around. And he brought that home and would speak to me, would give me basic directions in Spanish so that I would hear the sounds and begin to know some basic vocabulary. So at the dinner table, he would say things like, Nicole, pasame la mantequilla. And I'm like, hmm. And I would give him the pepper. And he's like, no, <laughs> la mantequilla. And I would see that he was eating a piece of corn and assume, oh, he wants the butter. So that was where I began. Uh, it's okay. super functional and realistic. <laughs> I love super it. Super functional. And, and, you know, and again, hearing all those hearing and pronouncing all those different phonemes at a very young age helped me, uh, you know, helped me to have a greater grasp on the Spanish language than someone who might not hear or say any of those things until they were older. Uh, that's so cool. And it, and your dad was, I guess, so he wasn't a native speaker of Spanish or fluent of Spanish. He was passing on, I guess, third hand learned Spanish. Absolutely. Passing on third hand learned functional conversational Super functional <laughs> yeah awesome uh did you then go on to study spanish in school or did you study something different and then sort of <laughs> fall backwards into spanish teaching i did um i started um i started taking spanish in seventh grade eight, uh, middle school i forget what grade but i started taking spanish in middle school 
took Spanish all the way through high school, you know, all the way up through Spanish five. And then when I got to college, I was a Spanish major as well. Spanish, psychology, and special education. My goodness. Yeah. Every Again, everybody's good at something. Academics are my jam. <laughs> oh, well. As and, a... As a German major, everybody knows eventually they're going to have to read a really, really scary author called Goethe. Goethe. It's, uh, it's unavoidable. Uh, for you guys, would it have been, did you have to read like the whole Don Quixote in Spanish? <laughs> is that like the one that everybody was afraid of? Or is there, is there another one that I don't even know about not, not being a Spanish guy? I'm cracking up because I clearly remember reading the, you know, thousand pages of Don Quixote de la Mancha. And interestingly, it's written, the, the version that we read is written in the Spanish that was spoken at the time that it was written. So the language has not changed tremendously, but it has changed. So that added another layer of complexity to understanding, reading and understanding this novel. Wow. A whole semester. A decade ago, I tried reading it in English. I got maybe 190 pages deep and I had an annotated version. <laughs> and literally half the book I had, this thing was a brick. Half the book was all the annotations in the back. And yes. almost every single line had like a superscript. One, two, three, you went in the back. It was, just, it was too complex. much. If, if I'd have just read through, I think I might have survived. But I was a psycho, so I wanted to read the annotations too. <laughs> put myself out. I'm sure it's better in Spanish. I believe it probably yeah. is. <laughs> and and where did we, uh, what, was it in Newark that you went to school? I went to, um, let's see, grammar school was in Bloomfield. Um, grew up in, you know, town of Bloomfield. And then college was uh, Rutgers, New Brunswick. <laughs> Are you rah, rah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of famous people coming out of Rutgers. My favorite Rutgers celebrity was Bill Bellamy, the MTV personality. Very <laughs> nice. I saw it's very cool. I think I forget. He's either from Piscataway or Plainfield, but he's from right nearby. He's a local. <laughs> All six foot five of them. <laughs> and uh, and home now is West Orange. Home now is West Orange. I love it because my family chose this chose this town because diversity is a major, major factor for my family. We wanted to live in a town that doesn't quote unquote tolerate diversity. We wanted to live in a town that celebrates, embraces and lives and breathes the beauty of lots of different people living together. Uh, that's awesome. And uh, also I, I actually don't know, I'm asking you is, is what was Thomas Edison from West Orange? Yes. The, or is that just where the work got? in Llewellyn Park? It's you know a, one of the first gated communities. Um, it's still very fancy, so you can go to them. You can go and visit the mansion now if you want to. And one of his first um, factories, right on Main Street in West Orange, and the Edison Museum. Yeah, uh, people forget that New Jersey has culture and and academia and things every now and then. Well, shame on them because New Jersey. Shame on them, indeed. Indeed, shame on them. Uh, <laughs> Nicole, switching gears, are you currently watching anything fun on Netflix or any of your digital streaming accounts right now so we can steal ideas from you for shows? Interestingly, I'm I'm not much of a TV person. Um, when the new episodes come out, I have been watching The Handmaid's Tale. And that's, you know, that's, that, that's not warm and fuzzy viewing no. at all. Um, I read the novel um, the summer that I lived in Spain. One of the things that I did was read The Handmaid's Tale when I wasn't in like, you know, the Plaza Mayor and yeah. Haciendo Fiesta. But <laughs> I'm not really a big TV person. I'm much more of a music person. That's fair. When you read The Handmaid's Tale, did you read it in Espanol? No, I read it in English. Fair. <laughs> Okay. Uh, Nicole, is it safe to assume then that your uh, favorite food would be something uh, culturally Hispanic or do we have favorite foods that are more culturally New Jersey? <laughs> <laughs> Pro 
probably more culturally um, tri-state area. I'm my family and I went on a pizza tour, um, maybe when the kids were maybe in middle school, so maybe about five ish, maybe half a dozen years ago, and um, we went on a pizza tour. There was an article in it was either the New Yorker or New York Magazine about the top twenty pizza locations in New York City. And my family made it our mission to go to all 20 of the top 20 pizza places. Oh, how long did that take? That's awesome. Not as, not as long as one might think. We were um we were very uh we were very driven. There were days when we would eat pizza twice, even three times. Like, okay, we're gonna go to we're going to the Bronx. We're going to Brooklyn and then we're going back to Manhattan. We're having pizza three times today. Yeah. Good times. Anybody from Chicago who's listening to this is probably having an aneurysm, but that's that's their problem. Well, them and their deep dish. Different strokes for different folks. <laughs> of course. Right. Uh Nicole, you're currently reading anything? Um, let's see. What am I reading right now? Um Actually, most of what I'm reading right now is work related. I haven't actually read a novel in uh, in in quite some time. And, you know, I think that'll be one of my New Year's resolutions. I need to get back into into reading more for for pleasure. You and I are in the exact same boat. Only work stuff right now. I don't know. I don't know how it happens. <laughs> Just very insane. Even like if a- you do 15, you know, 10, 15 minutes before you go to sleep, at least it's something. So. Yeah. Oh, I do that. I keep the book on my nightstand saying that that's what I'm going to do. And then uh, I <laughs> never happens. Or I wake up the next day with a bent folded book underneath my shoulder. It's just <laughs> that's not good for your brain or your shoulder. It's, nor is it good for the book either. I don't think. <laughs> True. Yeah. Uh, Nicole, so many of the teachers at LLN just know what we're like on Zoom and what our voices sound like or what our emails look like. But obviously, we all have lives outside of our uh, our duties to Sean. So, uh, you mentioned music, obviously, as a hobby. Do you have two other hobbies you want to tell your supervisees besides uh, music interest? Let's see. I also um, I also love to cook. Um, oh. Again, when my children were smaller, I'm thinking about Christmas Eve. I don't know how I did it, but Christmas Eve's... I would cook appetizers. I would have an open house for about 40 people and just keep the appetizers and snacks coming all night long. I would get up at five o'clock in the morning and start cooking and just keep cooking until, you know, until it was time for, okay, kids, you got to go to bed because otherwise Santa won't come. So I love, love, love to cook. And what else do, let's see, music? and cooking and um hmm. also to anyone listening to this it's december 23rd and we just had an, a supervisor's meeting prior to this and nicole mentioned she's going to cook the seven fish dinner for christmas eve tomorrow and that i was trying to think of seven different fish <laughs> dishes during the and i couldn't so i don't know how you're gonna do it god bless you indeed well that's why i'm cheating some of them will be you know courtesy of the local sushi restaurant because it's still fish so there you go. It's still fish. <laughs> and I'm trying to think, do I have a third hobby? It's mostly yeah, music and cooking are my are my biggest loves. That's awesome. And there are two things you can do it simultaneously. True. <laughs> uh, that's also a perfect segue into the next question, which is what kind of music do you listen to? Mm, almost everything. I love all kinds of music. I'm not a huge fan of um, of bluegrass. I'm not a huge modern country fan, but pretty much anything else. Um, I love my biggest love, rock and roll. I'm I'm I am I am a punk rock maniac. <laughs> um, old school hip hop classic rock um classical opera i i love music my grandmother my grandmother was a professor of ethnomusicology 
at Montclair State University and was a church organist for my entire childhood. Music is, it's in my blood, it's in my veins. You know, everybody's got a different definition as what constitutes punk rock. So to you, is punk rock like the clash from the UK in the 80s or is it like Green Day? Or is it yet something different that I have even mentioned? You know, Adam, it's funny that you would mention those two bands as examples of punk, because on one of my biceps is tattooed the cover of London Calling by The Clash. Get out! On my other arm is tattooed the autographs of all three members of Green Day. I had each of them sign my arm with a Sharpie marker. It took five years to get all three guys, but I had each of them sign my arm with a Sharpie marker. And in each case, I wrapped it in plastic and then went and got them tattooed on the next day. I legitimately had no idea. And I, I can't even begin to wrap my head around the coincidence. That those are the two bands I picked. And those are the- Seriously. <laughs> Crazy. So they both count is the short answer to that question. Both counts. Yes. Yes. Oh, rock Classic the punk all the way through, you know, quote unquote, pop punk. It's all good. So, but what is the music then that you yourself play primarily? Um, let's see. Me, myself. Um, you know, I have never, well, since I played violin in grammar school, much to everyone's chagrin, I've never, other than vocal music, I haven't been I haven't been um, a musician myself in life, but so more a vocalist then. Pardon? More more a vocalist then. More a vocalist, yeah. definitely more a vocalist, which comes in handy as you know, as an educator, oh, as an early percent. childhood educator. I can. There's a song for almost everything. There is. There is indeed. So even if you wanted to teach music and you didn't get to, it's so easy to teach music in a foreign language class. Absolutely. Absolutely. And for some children, that's one of their strongest modalities for learning. So it's it's important to work music into your instruction. Of course, create an earworm. <laughs> uh, Nicole, uh, what would you say is the country that you've most enjoyed visiting? Since that's a lot of people's hobbies too, traveling. Mm. Goodness gracious. Um, wow, that's a tough one. I'm fortunate that I have been, I have visited a bunch of different countries. I would have to say though, um, I would have to say that visiting St. Martin in the Caribbean, both the French side and the Dutch side, um, St. Martin is probably one of my favorite places in the entire world. It's incredibly beautiful. Um, the people are so very friendly. The food is fantastic. And, you know, you can stand across the street from the airport if you want to. And when the jets take off, you can get blasted by, by the jets taking off across the street from you. And the sand, the sand blowing into your skin kind of feels like what getting tattooed feels like. Oh, I only have one on my back and it was a good 21 years ago I don't okay know, I don't know that I remember equating it with getting blasted by sand but it's... that sand is blasting really really hard awesome we need to get Sean to the ocean tattoo. when the plane was taking off and we're like okay none of this mommy mm -mm. <laughs> awesome uh Nicole do you have a favorite activity to do with your students in class when you teach them one is one again is definitely singing um singing and singing and dancing with the children is uh that's very close to the top of the list and also um having students having students converse with one another that's that's huge and my niche is working in you know with the the littlest students so Getting them to have those conversations is, you know, it's it's definitely it definitely takes time and takes effort. But when it happens, seeing 
children speaking with one another in a foreign language is one of my favorite things to do. The goal. That's the goal. That's the goal. Percent the goal. Socially and academically, linguistically. Nicole, I feel like my next question is kind of a silly one because you mentioned earlier that uh, your mom was just such a big inspiration in you becoming a teacher. Um, besides your mom, did you have any other role models in education or in becoming uh, a foreign language educator? Or my just mom, and certainly, certainly my grandmother, um, you know, pro Professor Waters. Um, she started her bachelor's degree at the age of 43 years old. God bless her. Yeah, married Why? three children and decided it was time to get some more education. So, and then, you know, as her be going on and becoming a professor, I can't think of, I can't think of a more powerful role model than my grandmother. Never too late. Never too late. Absolutely. Uh, Nicole, the next thing I want to ask you is super, super unfair because if someone were to ask me this right now, I would not be able to answer it. I think it's the equivalent of uh, asking a mother what her favorite child is. So in this regard, what is uh, one of your most memorable teaching moments? And it's unfair because I couldn't tell you right now. There's too many. Actually, it's easy. I'll never forget this moment. I was okay. teaching preschool, um, just a, you know, a gen ed, um, gen ed preschool uh, program. And the children were there during choice time. They were playing with toys. And I looked across the room and one little girl was looking at me with this really strange look on her face, looking at me kind of like really, really quizzically. And I looked at her and I said, honey, you, you look like you feel kind of strange right now. Are you okay? And she said, Miss Nicole, I just love you so much feels weird in my body how much I love you I will remember that I will remember that until my very last day because I knew that part of what I was doing was giving this child an introduction to her life as a student with comfort safety validation and feeling that it was a good place where she belonged. I'm pretty sure it was the towards the uh the beginning of the school year at in 2018. Awesome. And uh what is your I mean I know obviously but to tell everybody listening what is your current role at LLN? My current role at LN LLN is um, working as a supervisor. I was a classroom teacher primary um initially and you know a the pandemic and b um some some personal health issues kind of plucked me out of the classroom so um so i can stayed in touch with sean and sean kind of knocked on my door and said nicole there are a lot of teachers who would benefit from your experience, your expertise, your <laughs> long time <laughs> as an educator, and also, he's so kind, and your personality, your interpersonal skills. So I'm working as a supervisor now. And speaking of Sean, that's a perfect segue into the next question is, uh, how did you come to meet Sean and work for LLN? It's slightly different for everybody. And, you know, I'm thinking back and I don't remember exactly how our paths crossed, but what I do remember is when we were finally able to, when we were finally able to meet in person, you know, back when that was like a thing, we met at a Starbucks and talked over a cup of coffee and we were, we were thick as thieves and could barely stop talking because our philosophies, our interests were so, so similar that we had an instant connection and it has 
endured for all these years and you know through through all the germs floating through the air you know, speaking of sean i mean one of the reasons i'm grateful to work uh for ellen is i've just learned so much from sean uh, especially from the tech end uh working here for this long do you can you think of something uh even if it's multiple things that you've learned while working for sean and for ellen i have one of the things that i've learned is um how it is in fact possible to work effectively with young children virtually. It's not easy, but- It could be done. It can be done. It can be done. And, you know, once again, if you sing to them, that's, a, that's always very helpful. But I've learned a lot about working, um, working virtually with young children. And I've also learned about the, um, I've learned about all of the components of language instruction, because it's not, it's a lot more than just vocabulary, matching the vocabulary on a vocabulary quiz. Definitely. There's so much more to it. And uh, finally, Nicole, what would you say is something that you'd like your supervisees or just any of the other LLN teachers to, uh, to know about you? I would like um, my supervisees and, you know, also all of my colleagues and anyone who I, who I encounter and who I interact with, I would like people to know that the most important thing to me is kindness, compassion. The connection between people is what drives me. So anything that anyone needs. If I can't figure out how to do it myself or how to be helpful myself, I will make it a priority to find out how to be of assistance to people. That's, that is what, that's my driving force in life. Kindness is everything. Of course. It's almost like teaching at the end. It's relationship building first. And then that makes the teaching so much easier. Absolutely. Absolutely.